Welcome to the Poetic Justice Podcast, where I, your host, the Stormy Poet, seek to enlighten the masses about the complexities of racism and how to permanently eliminate the system of white supremacy by utilizing the power of reading and writing slash language arts, by inspiring others to combat and defeat the system of racism through those means. And I also utilize this platform to share quality literature to you, the people. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join today's program. And today I wanted to talk about something that I have to admit I feel a little bit embarrassed about saying in the first place. But I think one of the marks of a real man is when he can admit there's something that he doesn't know or when there was a time where he didn't have a particular piece of knowledge. I'll admit I have to blush internally at the fact that as big as an advocate as I am, about the need for black people to consistently read and write on a daily basis for the sake of effectively arming ourselves with as much constructive information as possible and successfully retaining it also. And as frequently as I speak out against and condemn the system of white supremacy, one of the most essential forms of documentation, one that not only expands the mind's ability to critically think, but that gives concrete information on how to dismantle it, is a book I've only just read now here in July of 2021. That book is the autobiography of our master teacher, Malcolm X. It is one that took me over three decades to finally sit down and read. And up to that point, um, up to the point I made the choice to actually read it with all the many sources of information out there pretending on how to combat racism, I pretty much assumed I already had enough knowledge in my intellectual you know, arsenal to be able to utilize to to turn into substantive action in terms of putting a dent in this wicked system we live under and in terms of making significant progress on behalf of the people. Well, as one of our master teachers, Millie Fuller, always says, I'm still learning. And I think that's so true. And one of the markers of a person who can effectively and correctly disseminate useful and practical information such as like a teacher or a broadcaster is that they should always be in the process of learning after reading this masterful and quite frankly painstakingly put together piece i've evolved even further in the sense that i now understand i will be learning for the rest of my days and that is a philosophy i feel we all as a people should adopt i truly believe we'd be better off overall for doing so I believe that this is the mind. This, I believe that this is a mindset all people, but especially us as black people, should freely and readily adopt. And I believe we should approach life in general with that particular way of thinking. The autobiography of Malcolm X, as told by Alex Haley, is one of those books that causes you to recalibrate the entire way you think about a particular topic. And in doing so, it encompasses the oftentimes overlooked and untapped power of the language arts. The power of literature, and I mean this over cinema, radio, audio books, and even music, has the unique power in that it forces the reader to use their own imagination. It forces the reader to put themselves in the character's shoes for the simple fact there is no audible or visual information to fill in the place of what the reader is supposed to essentially fill in on their own. All the reader has is the black and white of the letters in the paper and their own unique mental spin on the story that's being presented to them. Being forced to put yourself in the character's shoes by being encouraged at your own pace to read at your own pace and to and not the pace of you know the time limits of a movie or an audio book or a TV show. What this does is it inspires empathy. It inspires understanding and it inspires regard for the experiences of others. Also being able to grab a highlighter or a pen or something like that and to actually be able to mark up certain lines that resonate with you. Certain things that resonate with you and speak to speak to your individual circumstance. Being able to concretely interact with the information you're observing makes for a more fulfilling and impactful interaction, which forms a bond essentially inside your own conscience itself. And speaking of movies, I, like most of you listening, I have seen the Malcolm X movie where 
Denzel Washington, in my humble opinion, gave his absolute best best acting performance and one of the greatest acting performances, quite frankly, I've ever seen of all time. This brother could have literally stopped acting after that and still would have went down as one of the best actors of all time based on that one role that he absolutely slayed. That said, as is in the case with movies versus books, the book has the ability to present many intricate details for the fact there's no time constraints. There are no distracting elements like music or special effects. And for those with a short attention span, the book gives the reader a more accessible method to come back to the book multiple times that they have to step away for the, and for the purposes that the viewer picking up where they, you know, have left off and have the ability to easily go back to and reference information. It makes it for a much more effective way to absorb knowledge. This masterfully and eloquently written book. It's about a man who at every stage of an, every stage in his life encounter blatant and open white supremacy all the way from his family being harassed consistently where he grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, his family being consistently harassed and constantly harassed by the black legion, which was a white supremacist terror organization. This happened when he was just six years old and having his house burned down to the ground at six years old, all the way to when he had his own house burned down with his wife and daughters inside where they barely escaped later on in life. This is a book about a man who saw his father and uncle murdered by white supremacists and about a man who saw his mother railroaded into the mental health system that sought and still seeks to emotionally cripple black people, which is succeeded in doing to Malcolm's mother. This is a story about a black child who just like what happens in the modern era was directly and subliminally told through the who are where they're directly and subliminally told throughout their lives by savage and soulless monsters who collaborate and target against them on every level and everyone who looks like them and where they dictate to you what you should and should not aspire to. There was an instance where young Malcolm was attending a predominantly white school during his foster home years where his teachers and his peers would quote unquote, where his teachers and his peers who quote unquote liked them but they yet would still crack inward jokes on a regular basis. Now, how many black people out there within the sound of my voice have had to experience that same thing growing up, uh, especially if you went to a school with white kids and even, and I'm not even saying that it had to be a predominantly white school. Hell, the schools I attended between Texas and Mississippi weren't predominantly white. And I still heard inward jokes, which normally followed with them proclaiming it was just a joke, which normally followed, up with them getting laid the hell out which I'm sure is the case with most of y'all but I can't tell you how many times I ended up in the prince, principal's office over scuffles related to something like that and as I'm sure is the case with most of you I have zero regrets and oh yeah my parents had zero regrets during that time also they didn't you know punish me for standing on my score which I'm eternally grateful for but not only that Malcolm X Malcolm X's teachers themselves will crack in word jokes on him too now, I've never had a teacher directly crack inward jokes to my face, but at the same time, a few teachers would tell me jokes about other races of people. And it would always make me think, you know, just what do you say about black people when I'm not around? So just because you're not talking about me now, I'm like, what do you say when we're not in the room? Malcolm in his autobiography said to one of his school teachers he wanted to be a lawyer to which the teacher responded to him that in words weren't meant to be lawyers and that the best they could hope for was to pick up some kind of trade. I can't say a teacher ever told me something like that, but as I'm sure most of you can identify with, we we saw all the patience, time and energy and motivation the teachers, both white and black, poured into white students. The more interested we were in areas like science, art, economics, and politics, the more we were told, you know, we talked too much, uh, that we were too rowdy and rambunctious, and that we asked too many questions. Can you believe my fifth grade teacher actually complained to my father and mother that I, quote unquote, asked too many questions? That is most of what 99.9% .9 of black kids have to experience growing up in this excuse for a school system. Not much, not much of a surprise there. 
There's a story about how the, or rather, this is a story about how imperfect people, this is a story about how imperfect people are the ones who are called to do the most divine work. As black people, definitely none of us are holier than now. We all have a checkered past and it's impossible living under the system of dysfunction that we've been subjected to since we were born to be perfect. It's, of course, it's you know impossible for anyone to be perfect, but being under this system is especially uh, impossible for that. A lot of us are waiting to become some kind of perfect version of what we're supposed to be, whether it be financially or intellectually, before we devote our being to helping the cause and to empowering the black collective. It's never been the perfect people throughout history who've made the most constructive impacts. It's been those who used what they've learned from their mistakes, from the mistakes they made and the mistakes of others. And it's been the ones who've used their skills they've attained by living in the wilderness of those that those mistakes banished them to in order to help others from making those same mistakes in order to in order to freely give those skills to others so that they can utilize them without having to go through the same heartache, failure and suffering to obtain them. This is a story of addiction. Many black people out there contended with this as my own father did, which ended up ultimately taking his life, which I and many of my family members have had to contend with. But many black people are subscribing. Many black people are subscribing to the coping mechanism of drugs to deal with the system that's hammering away at our psyches on a daily and hourly basis. It doesn't even have to be alcohol, narcotics. It could be retail therapy, you know, consumption. It could be food. You know, spending countless hours on social media, all of these things are equally detrimental to the emotional, psychological and physical health of black people and the stability of us as individuals. To further my point, Malcolm broke down how when West Indian Archie, a well-respected crime boss in Harlem in the 1940s, actually had a hit out for him. And I'll let you read the book for yourself to figure out how that came to be. But Malcolm X got high on several different drugs, so much so to the point where he basically just didn't care that there was a hit out for his life. And as a matter of fact, he continued peddling weed and picking beats with other gangsters during the time that he actually had a hit out on him. There was one point where Malcolm described going to sell weed to this white lesbian couple where he had uh, weed, alcohol, pills and cocaine all in his system all at once. They hit out for him at the time, but he was so inebriated that he ended up passing out on the couch at the house of the lesbians and waking up several hours later. Just one of many drug induced stories. And he said towards the end of the book that he wanted to include these instances of drug abuse for the simple fact that he felt like he couldn't. He felt like the reader couldn't get a full summation of what kind of man he is without providing the detailed depiction of his shortcomings which is what I think is one of the manliest things a man can do. Bottom line, he was so gone on drugs, he didn't even care that he was being hunted down. That sadly is the state of many black people today, which is exactly what the people pulling the strings want. They want to keep Negroes so high and drugged out and obsessed with who's beef with who on world star and distracted with sports stats and things of that nature that they don't that black people don't even have the time to recognize nor fight the systematic threat that is trying to murder them and everyone who looks like them. Anyone can sit around talking about their accomplishments and for the most part most people only care about what someone has accomplished but they don't question or look into or examine the countless failures and poor choices it took for that person to get to that point of success. If for nothing else to demonstrate what it is someone shouldn't do if they wish to achieve that same success just as importantly as if they want to avoid those same failures this is a story of a life devoted to crime the lure and the glamour of a racially assimilated lifestyle and as a matter of fact Malcolm made sure to put specific he made sure to specifically highlight that during his street days in Harlem his fixation with straight hair and the majority of the men who were on the you know club and the jazz scene that hairstyle that they were rocking at the time, he made specifically sure to mention um, what that was. And he broke down the psychology of 
his unhealthy admiration for the straight European like hairstyle. The, the conk is what it was, where he actually physically, where you actually physically had to burn your scalp with lye and, and they used the potatoes and the eggs to straighten the hair. Now, I wonder what coon minded Negro even came up with and experimented enough to come up with a concoction like that to destroy the molecular structure of black hair enough for it to lie down straight. I mean, just how bad did this person want to be white just makes you wonder. But this is a story about incarceration. And as a matter of fact, Malcolm was so addicted to drugs that during his withdrawal episodes in jail, his cellmates thought he was so evil with the obscenities and the atheist rhetoric that he would spout that they called him Satan himself while he was in jail. This is a story about a man having a spiritual and intellectual awakening. As for how the almighty works so often or as the almighty often works in our lives, he allows us to sink to the bottom of the bottom in order to humble us so that he can properly send our lives down the trajectory he desires. And his story of prison life of becoming voracious of a voracious becoming a voraciously avid reader and having all the time in the world to think about, you know, the purpose of his existence, which was the catalyst for him later on devoting himself to the faith of Islam. We're all interested to get details of the human experience that this wonderful book touched on. This is a book about finding genuine and unshakable love in a woman and about finding a devotion to a cause that's bigger than yourself and your immediate family. The amount of stress time spent without her husband while he was away for weeks and months on him, the, you know, the amount of, of support she had for a man who dedicated his life not only to the betterment of black society but to provide for his wife and children the constant physical danger that she was subjected to her steadfast effort and work that she put in to appreciate to understand and to articulate the intellectual love of her man is nothing short of mind-boggling and betty shabazz is the ultimate example of what kind of woman it takes to deal with a black man who is a protector and provider for a better life for his his family but also someone who is a freedom fighter and who devotes his life on behalf of the people and as a matter of fact i wanted to read an excerpt from the book pertaining to that topic now i'm not of the muslim faith myself but i think what malcolm so eloquently stated in this excerpt transcends religion and i think it's something we all as a people can abide by when it comes to engaging in relationships because ladies it is indeed a man's job to protect and provide for you and to elevate your status in life. But at the same time, it's also a man's obligation to, f to fight for a cause bigger than himself and to create social change in the world around him in a, in a manner in which he makes the society better for his children and his future generations. And that is what Malcolm was about. And this excerpt depicts what Betty Shabazz was about in a full and unapologetic support and submission to her man. As a woman who supports a man who actually is about something substantive and as they should support them. And this is what the excerpt says. I guess by now I will say I love Betty. She's the only woman I ever thought about loving. And she's one of the very few four women whom I've ever trusted. The thing is, Betty's a good Muslim woman and wife. You see, Islam is the only religion that gives both husband and wife a true understanding of what love is the Western love concept. You take it apart. It really is lust, but love transcends just like the physical love is disposition, behavior, attitude, thoughts, likes, dislikes. These things make a beautiful woman, a beautiful woman. This is a beautiful. This is a beauty that never fades. You find in your Western civilization that when a man's wife's physical beauty fails, she loses her attraction, but Islam teaches us to look into the woman and teaches her to look into us. Now, ladies, I'm not saying to go join the Islamic faith, but how many of you can say that you have a man like that? A man who's down for a cause bigger than himself, but who still makes sure the family is good for generations to come. And how many of you can say that you have the integrity, endurance and scruples to back a man who is about that life? I'm not really talk. I'm not talking about some guy who just, you know, works a good job and comes home every day and gets the bills paid and all that, which is definitely what you should do as a man. But I'm talking about a man who takes the initiative and steps out to bring additional income, but who also has the guts to take a stance against injustices that the average man isn't willing to do. 
Furthermore, do you even value back in a man who is about that kind of life? Do you even see the value and the importance of it in terms of what kind of world that man is attempting to create for you and your future offspring? All that said, indubitably, the summation of one of the book's most vital and intended impacts it's, is its functionality as a detailed playbook as to what type of daily mindset and, beha- and behavior a black person should subscribe to in order to combat, counteract, and nullify the methods of systematic white supremacy here in America. This book is nothing short of one of the most strategic war documents that can be repeatedly referred to in terms of how to abolish the system of racism permanently. Malcolm X was a man of the maker, a warrior scholar, a protector, a provider, a devout husband, an honorable father, and loving sibling, a prophetic and masterly writer, an illustrious orator, and a leader who countless times in the face of mortal danger boldly congregated the people and who skillfully and self selflessly directed them in the path of their best interests. I easily put this in my top three books of most eloquently written, profound, timeless, painstakingly detailed. And I can't stress that enough painstakingly detailed thought provoking and life changing books of all time. This is required reading for everyone, but especially for any black person in existence, particularly black people in America. And by the way, have a highlighter when you read it. Um, There are many profound quotes to mark up in this one and be prepared to read it twice because you're going to want to. It is my conjecture. You cannot consider yourself a true American, no matter what race you are, until you read this book. And I mean that. But more importantly, as a black person in America, you will not have the proper tools needed to deal with systematic racism. I feel wholeheartedly until you read this book. That's how vital I feel like this book is. The book Dyer of Anne Frank is often referred to as one of the most important war documents of World War II. This is an invaluable and timeless war document mapping out how white supremacy can be taken down once and for all. And for us as a people to take heed to Malcolm Malcolm's countless warnings and instructions, I think us taking heed to that is one of the best ways to do his life and the sacrifice of his life justice. And it's to do justice to the lives of MLK and Fred Hampton and Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman, Denmark Vesey, Huey Newton, Mega Evers, and all the activists who decide who decided who dedicated and lost their lives to ensure their future generations didn't have to endure the lack of quality of life that white supremacy has inflicted on us. No matter who you are as a black person, if you're within the sound of my voice, it is indeed your responsibility to ensure to do to do everything in your power to make it possible that the future generations don't have to deal with this poisonous and toxic white supremacist environment that we have to deal with. Even if you don't have children, it's your obligation to all black kids to make sure that this world is a better place than we left it. This astounding, informative, and riveting document by our brother Malcolm X is the ultimate document to study and regularly reference if you as a black person want to create that kind of world for your future for future black generations to come. If you are new to this podcast, welcome to the family. This is a space where we engage in intelligent dialogue and thoughtful investigation, not emotions and feelings. If you like this commentary, please feel free to subscribe and go ahead and obliterate that notification bell so that you can stay up to date on any material I produce. It is my ongoing goal to bring you all increasingly more in-depth analysis. So please feel free to contribute monetarily to any of the links below. It would really mean a lot to me. My published works are also in the description, so feel free to snag yourself a copy and feel free to check out my other commentary and literary art at thestormypoet.com. That is thestormypoet.com. I'll see you all next time. And as always, one love and one justice. Peace.